Hello and welcome to a Black Up One Another Last All podcast. My name is Carl, and in honorary of Black History Month, we have made Danny a honorary black man. Um, so say hello, Danny. Hello, Danny. Is that why you trying to get me to move to Jamaica five minutes ago? Exactly. You know why would you not want to? Nice weather, why. nice food, but you just don't want to do sand. Sand. How many flat roads are there around Jamaica? I wouldn't. I would imagine it's much like much like it is in Ireland and other places like that. Places that aren't that big, where it's just going to be bumpy roads, hills, sand, trees. Well, I was going to say that you know the similarities between Jamaicans and Irish. You both say tree the same, so you know that's that's. If only my mother was here, she'd confirm that. Oh, oh well, uh, and also not forgetting the other black member of uh, ABW, Mr. Femi. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Good to see everyone. It's good to um, be here, man. It's been a couple of weeks now. So it has. And look, you join us just when we're speaking about the absolutely wonderful demolition of that lot up the road uh, on Sunday. Uh, I'm also kick straight into it because Femi, you was there. So um, just talk about the atmosphere in the ground, sort of like um, when the game started. Yeah, I, I tweeted actually that um, <clears throat> going in, I was like, well, the atmosphere in the stadium. Obviously, when you get in the concourses, it was different this time. You know, there was people, you know, we sit kind of, we sit in the West End, but we kind of, have, we can walk around. You know, Emirates is quite weird because you can walk around the whole stadium. It's not like other stadiums where they block off um, parts and sections where you can only get into certain sections. You can literally walk around once you're inside the whole stadium. So what people tend to do nowadays is mill around the clock end concourse and just, just get there and just sing, sing, sing. And it was, yeah, the atmosphere was building um, early. And what you could tell was if the players put in a performance it was going to be a crazy atmosphere and i've got to say i don't know in all the time that i've been there i don't think anything's touched it nothing at all in terms of just when you just looked around it was just like it was crazy it was that's actually what i picture going to football being like you know fans just constantly singing you could look in the highest (laughs) the highest parts of the stadium people was standing clapping the club level was was jumping up and down. You know, it was it was just it, it felt like a real you know European type atmosphere when you go to like German stadiums or Borussia Dortmund or something like that. That's literally what it felt like on this day. So yeah, no, that was um that I gotta say that's gonna live with me for a long time, man. Gotta say that for real. That that's definitely a memory that that I will take away from that game. I mean, Danny, you've been to uh, a lot of um, North London derbies at Highbury. Did anything kind of match what Femi was saying at Highbury? Oh, we saw the your video that you did. You, know, you tweeted it, and you up in the in the stands, and then all <laughs> shouting and screaming, look like you're having a lovely time. But um, I, I've been lucky enough. I think I may have seen twenty North London derbies. I've never seen Arsenal lose. Uh, that's, yeah, I uh, think that. <laughs> yeah, back in uh, back in the days when we were brilliant, but. The, the, the atmosphere was, was always um, upper level when it came to the North London derbies of any. I mean, if you play Man United or possibly Chelsea, then uh, and occasionally Liverpool, then they're the, probably the biggest, noisiest games of the season. But last week, I was saying, we went, did a, um, the predictions, and I said we're going to win 1 0. I was just confident we were going to win. Fem, would you say that the atmosphere helped encourage the players to play well? Because that is the absolute best I've seen Arsenal play. Uh, tactics wise positional wise goal everything for about five yeah. years yeah i mean if you think about it there hasn't been a north london derby in front of fans since what um emery was emery was in charge <laughs> so that would have been the four two um yeah two seasons ago novemberish time so emery was still the manager then and and things were beginning to go pear-shaped at that point so you know it's that probably helped as well you know that fan base is kind of is kind of rabid right now and when you talk about expectations i think it's just you know when you go into games against chelsea and man city 
you, you kind of just it's kind of like a, a resignation like if we get anything out of this it's amazing type thing but when you're going in against you know Tottenham who just they're just so meh you know you, you, you always you always look at them and you think oh look Harry Kane son oh they're going to give us so much trouble you know and then especially when we play them at home they they rarely do give us trouble to be honest with you and we 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 really went full steam into them and i think the atmosphere had a lot to play with that to be fair why weren't you there cal you usually go didn't you I do. However, I had to do something in the morning, which I didn't know what time I was going to finish. So I didn't want to risk buying a ticket and not going because there were still tickets available, which is very, very weird. Um, normally, like a week before a North London derby, there's no tickets at all. And I looked on maybe the Wednesday and there were still tickets available. Yeah, they were like £128. But even so, there were still tickets available, which I would have paid back, I'll be very, very honest, if I could guarantee me getting in there. And also, I understand that you have to get there quite early now oh. because of the time, of time it takes to get into the ground. <laughs> so I knew I definitely uh, couldn't risk it. But um, speaking about the game, Danny, was you surprised to see Granit Xhaka in the starting lineup? Oh, surprised? No. Disappointed? Yes. But I knew I didn't know better, <laughs> if that makes... Uh, Xhaka is always going to come in. If he's available, he is Arteta's man, and Arteta loves him. And we saw he brought him back, made him captain, give him a new contract. Now, you don't do that and then drop him. Uh, don't bring him back for the North London Derby because we always know that Xhaka is going to give everything. Sometimes he gives too much. I didn't want him to start because I thought we were on a really good run of four wins in a row, four clean sheets from five games, I think it was. Well, now we're on four in a row. And we have four mm. clean sheets from five games. And the Man City was on was the only one we didn't. And then everything just seemed to be nicely gelling and coming together. And there was a patterns forming. There's partnerships forming. The defence was looking really good. And then I thought, well, I don't know what I'm on about. If I knew anything about football, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you two. I'd be managing Real Madrid and taking buns off of super agents. So, uh, well, and in hindsight, I, I was right to say we were going to win. I was right to say we're confident. And we were right to do, yeah, we're going to do a live show after this because I think we all said we were going to win, though, didn't we, Carl? Yeah, I mean, this is very rare that I felt confident winning mm. in the North London derby. Those are the games that I, like we was talking, Danny, when um, the fixtures list come out, I look for the North London derby and I look for Manchester United because those are the two rivals that I grew up with. Those are the, you know, the enemies of Arsenal. And even in the week... I felt strangely confident that we was going to beat them. I didn't feel nervous. I didn't feel like, oh, I wonder if Harry Kane's going to turn it on. I wonder if, if Sun's going to come good. Because I've seen how Tottenham play, and I just wasn't worried. Like, I wasn't worried that Nunu would suddenly, you know, inspire them to, to beat us. And for some reason, I literally, when I even talking to my Tottenham friends, I was saying, you know we're going to win. And they're like, oh, it's going to be a, like a tough game. Like, no. I don't think he was going to win as easily as we did, I'll be very honest with you. But I was confident that we would come out victorious out of that game. And obviously, like, as soon as the game started, I don't know what Tottenham's tactics were. I don't know if it was just to cut out the hole in the field, because there were gaping holes in the centre of the park, which allowed us to play. I mean, the, the one thing you don't do is give the likes of Martin Odegaard space give the likes of Smith Rowe space, give the likes of Saka space to run at you. And I have no idea. Now. <laughs> I have <laughs> no idea why um, he, Nunu, decided to, you know, play a midfielder who has no concept of being in the midfield. Um, and the space that we had to run open, it was just brilliant. I mean, the first goal, it was... Mad. I mean, um, I can't remember who I can't remember who won it in midfield, but all I know is that the ball came out. I think it was um, Grand Xhaka, and it came out to Martin Odegaard. And, no, sorry, and then Martin Odegaard then played it to Saka. Saka went past um, their left back and literally put it onto a plate for Emil Smith Rowe. I mean, Femi, when that first goal went in, the noise must have been absolutely like, yeah, brilliant. 
And you know what you're saying about the first goal? You know the first goal started from Ben White winning a header against Harry Kane. He That's doesn't how win first, headers, though. He doesn't win headers. Isn't that what we heard for the whole, <laughs> uh, you know, that, remember the Sky, what, I don't even know if it was analysis or just like a destruction of him after one game. And I, I thought it was really harsh to say, okay, this guy can't compete in the air after, you know, he had a tough first game. Um, he can't compete in the air. That's all we kept hearing. And I, and I kept thinking, but he, he played in a two-man defense in Leeds, didn't he, for a whole season. And that is in the, in the championship, which is probably more more physical than the, the Premier League in a way. So he won the header, of course. So that's what set Erdegaard off um, and running to play the ball to Saka. And seriously, you know, Saka to Emil Smith Rowe, as they said at the game, that's stuff of dreams, isn't it? So, you know, when you've got two of your own basically combining to score such a beautiful free-flowing goal you know of course everyone's going crazy celebrations were really good you know everyone loves a good knee slide don't they (laughs) (laughs) a a nice little knee slide and you know what makes a knee slide better when the two other players slide right behind him as well so you see (laughs) Saka coming in you see Xhaka just sliding in it's like yeah yeah we're, we're we're on today to be honest with you but um, no, um, big, big credits to Smith Rowe. You know, he, he, they did set him a bar actually at the end of last season when Arteta said, if you play, you know, in an attacking position for Arsenal, you should be aiming for 10 goals. Let's be honest, you, you, you know, if it was, if he wasn't 20 years old, if he was, um, uh, you know, a, a more mature player, you, you would be expecting. If you're starting for Arsenal, you know, you, we expect our midfielders, our attacking midfielders, to be scoring between eight to ten goals. We we have to demand that if we want to move forward. You know, we, we have to look at the levels and the, the pace that teams like Liverpool and Man City set and say, okay, we're not there yet, but that's what we have to strive for, which means our players have to get those numbers at some point. So it's it's a good start for, for him. You know, he scored what, two goals in all comps now? So, you know, let's let's see what, what, what we can what they can come up with. I think that's going to be the name of this week's podcast. Everybody loves a knee slide. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was three in that game, wasn't there? Um, it was. Oh, yeah. Henri was there, wasn't it? They all did the same celebration. <laughs> it was because like, we talk about the second goal now, and I think it was brilliant from Granite Xhaka. He rolled, I think it's Heuberg, um, and he tried to say it was a foul, and it clearly wasn't. And I think he played it out to um, Kieran Tierney. I think Tierney played it forward to um, Abamian. Abamian, a nice little flick round to Smith Rowe. And Smith Rowe, in, again, acres of space, which still baffles me. I mean, I don't really care because it's them up the road, but there was no midfield to Spurs at all in that game. And it just, again, makes you think, and you were saying, Danny, if you was any good at football tactics, then you would be sitting here. But, you know, you and I, who, okay, you watch football for longer than I have, Danny, but clearly know that you've got Martin Odegaard, who is one of the best, you know, young midfielders in the world at the moment, Smith Rowe, who is up and coming and absolutely brilliant, and Saka, who's, you know, um, one of the best English youngsters, and you're giving them that much space away as well. That It just makes you think that you say, you know, only people who are good at football are managers and stuff, but is Nunu like I don't really care because I hope he plays like that against us all the time and every other team in the Premier League all the time just gives them space. But don't you think that was almost suicide tactics from him? Well, I remember the commentators saying Arsenal keep leave, making the same trap. So when the yeah, I think the ball started from from the left hand side. There, um, our, our goalkeeper played it out, and I remember thinking at the time, uh, Ramsdale. Oh, he's done another short pass. And then their Spurs player comes sliding. I don't remember which one it was. And I, I think it was uh, probably um, Xhaka. Who, uh, was it Xhaka? Right. It was Xhaka yeah. or White. Got the ball. Passed it out wide to Tierney. And then Tierney did a, just kind of hoofed the ball. Went, wallop, have some of that. And then Obama Young got it and did a quick one-two with uh, with Smith Rowe. And I'm thinking, here you go. Smith Rowe's going to put it. He's going to cross it into the middle of the box, waiting for Saka at the far post. But he didn't. He gave it to Alba. And Alba just went, I'll have that, and slotted it away. And the, the way that the improvement from 
from Alba from earlier in this or at the end of last season, he was constantly running, constantly looking for everything. And then when when Smith Rowe scored the uh, scored the first goal, I think looking at the camera, you he had over to Smith Rowe's left, but our right, you saw um, a Bummy Young standing there in the close up shot and celebrating. You thinking, wow, he's, he's really up for this. And then he, he scores that goal, and he was. He knew what was going to happen. Get the ball, run, pass it on to Smith Rose, and then Smith Rose did a one-two when he put it in. And then we did that so much in the first half. We'd set them up the same way, draw them in, draw them in, bang, get them on the counter attack. Remember when, we, when Arteta first took over? That's how we were winning games was was on the counter attack. And teams, could, Liverpool, Man City, Chelsea, none of us, none of them could could stop us. And that's how we won the FA Cup final, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, Aubameyang really. I think I think it was Chris who said Aubameyang is a showman, and I think last season when there wasn't a crowd, you could tell he was maybe he wasn't really up for it just because you know there was no one singing his name, no one kind of you know jeering him on. And some people need that. Some people really need That's you know a, a, an atmosphere, yeah. and you know he's got that back now. And especially in a packed stadium like Femi was saying, the North London derby. What better place to put on um, a show of your talents, and and that's what he did. You know, you could you couldn't fault him in that game. He was he was very very good, and you know, hopefully there's more to come. But maybe you know the crowds being in the, the stadium is just going to help him just a little bit because when he's happy, he plays well. There's there's no doubt about that. When a Batman is happy, he plays very very well, and maybe he needs that sort of. You know, someone to, to scream his name and to tell him, you know, you're brilliant, you're brilliant, because some players do really need that. Um, you know what? You know what? Yeah, just jumping on that as well. This is a guy that loves his Lamborghinis and his his little family parties and all of this type of stuff. All of that stuff was gone last year, if you think about it, because we were, we spent majority of the time in and out of lockdown, didn't we? So all of that, you know, driving around in these fast cars, getting his cars wrapped, football, getting his hair cut. Remember when he got his hair cut last year and he got, you know, people were like calling him out. Oh, you're not allowed to get your hair cut. We're still in love. Do you remember all of that stuff? Like, imagine what what effects that has on a, a guy that, you know, those are the things that he loves. He loves being flashy. He loves these private jets to... Gabon, he loves all of that stuff. That's that's what we see in all these pictures and these videos, and all of that was stripped away from him last season, last year. If you think about it, so how does that affect you know a guy that 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 does love all that stuff? You know, how did it affect players that were coming from abroad in January and they're coming into a stay in a hotel and they're in lockdown basically. They're not allowed to go out. You know, they're not. You know, and football's on the strict protocols as well, especially in last season where. They weren't allowed to do this. They weren't allowed to do that. You can't get a haircut. You can't, and they had to be on their best behavior because if they did anything wrong, there will be pictures of them all over social media and people saying, "Oh, he broke protocol. He broke." Imagine the effect that that has on you know some people are family men. They just love staying at home and it didn't really affect them. But some people, they just you know they want to go out in their wrapped Lamborghini and drive around <laughs> and make a loud noise. I mean. Yeah. yeah, you're right, because even there was a video of him leaving the ground in his Lamborghini. I mean, it's, you know, he's not someone who wants to be inconspicuous, like, <laughs> in the slightest, because you don't drive a Lamborghini through North London if you're trying to be inconspicuous at all. But like you, like you said, Femi, like, it may have affected him a lot because all the things that he wants to do to show out, to, you know, to show who he is and to laugh and smile and... He, He's almost like an attention person. I mean, let's be honest, you don't drive a Lamborghini unless you really want the attention, do you? And the haircuts uh, as well, man. The, the yeah. sick, sick, flashy haircuts. They were all... He can even get his haircut, man. <laughs> and that's what he wants. He wants the attention. But obviously, during um, lockdown, and when we couldn't attend football games, he wasn't getting that because mm. all you was probably hear is Arteta shout um, from the sidelines, like, Oba, Oba, stay on the wing. Because he clearly went a lot to go up front, but now he's being played centre forward. Now we've got like uh, Martin Odegaard and Saka and Emil Smith Rowe almost as the, the midfield three. I feel like Aubameyang now 
has is playing in his correct position. I'm sure at some point in the season he will play on the left wing, but right now he is the certified out and out striker. And they even that's, his... that's what he should have been. That's how he made his name at Saint Etienne and then um and then Dortmund. And then uh, and for the national team, wherever he went. He's, if he was going to play as a winger, then he'd be he'd be play there and he'd be able to come in and then bring it in and score the goals. But it's far too often when he was playing last or the, the last year or so, he's been playing there while Lacazette has been playing up front or Nketiah or any of that lot. And then so he can't run into the middle and then do the strike a bit. So he's only doing the out wide bit and then just must must have driven drove him nuts. I mean, yeah, he, he is a striker and that's what he wants to do. He wants to be the person on the... He doesn't want to be the person providing crosses. He wants to be the person on the end of crosses. He wants to be the person who, you know, finishes off the move and scores the goal. And Plus he has a relationship off. with the, the formation at the moment where Smith Rowe will drop into midfield, in, into sort of central mid... Or maybe a second line in, in midfield. And then Young can go out wide left. And then he can come in and be a striker. And when he does that, then Smith, for, Smith Rowe will go forward into the forward left position like a left wing or whatever you want to call it. But I was quite impressed by the way our midfield was so was able to, one would go forward, Odegaard or Smith Rowe, and then the other one would drop back. And it was the same with Partey and uh, and Xhaka, where they would both, well, one of them would go forward a bit and the other one would stay back. And even there was a, a really good combination between um, um, Tommy Yashu and Saka on the right. Considering Tommy's only played four or five games for us, that that's, that partnership is already looking really good, and if we can get that on the left hand side, if we can have a little bit of structure to who plays where, then Tierney, being an experienced left back, and and Smith Rowe, if they can get a partnership up on that side, because you look at all the years of having a partnership between the winger and the fullback, how often have we had it where we've had two both sides having really good partnerships? It's very rare. It's usually one side or the other, isn't it? Because it used to be Monreal, and then who would play on the left with Monreal? Or you'd have Bellerin and Walker on the right, and then that, that Alex, sometimes Alexis works. and Monreal, wasn't it? Maybe. There you go. Yeah. So if, if it looks like if we can do that, but we said for ages it, we need a smaller squad and we need players to play in the same positions, but then have the freedom to move around and do stuff. And oh, it's just looking too good to be true, isn't it? I know. And <laughs> talking of too good to be true, we scored a third in the um, in the first half when I was in. I was delirious. What I liked about the third goal is that the move was started and finished by Harry Kane. Because for <laughs> me, it was, it was absolutely... I mean, I don't know what it happened. He fell over the ball um, on the edge of our box. Thomas Partey sort of capitalised on it. And again, their midfield. So you've got that Deli Alley. He was just walking. Like, you think to yourself, there's a break on... And you've got Deli Ali, uh, Dombele, and Hoiberg all at the top of the pitch. I mean, poor Harry Kane is trying to sprint back as fast as he can to stop the counter attack, and he hasn't. Martin Odegaard, no, Smith Rowe plays it out wide to Saka. Saka sort of runs at Eric Dyer, and <laughs> the comic, the comical Harry Kane comes sliding in. I mean, he's lucky he sort of got the touch of the ball because if he'd taken out Saka, that's a penny all day. And um, he's played the ball, brilliant assist, right into Saka's path, Saka right foot, right into the corner, 3-0. I mean, could you write that script any better for me? <laughs> oh, man. You know what? The funniest part was I, I watched that I watched that back yesterday, actually, and I saw the, the four. It wasn't even a slip. He actually just fell over the ball. He had the ball at his feet. He actually fell over the ball. And... What I loved most about this goal was obviously the commentary when I got to listen to it back, where, where Gary Neville's just gone, Spurs are done here. <laughs> I just thought, this is amazing. I thought, what is going on here? But you know what? This we've we've had we used to get this on the Wenger, didn't we? Where we get this this uh, splurt of goals like we always used to get it on the Wenger, we, even in big games. Remember the um. Was it Chelsea? We had a Chelsea one once Five where two. we blitzed them. And that's Van where Persie the... Trick. No, not that one. It was that home where Nasri, Van Persie... It was like one of the only times Nasri, Van Persie, Walkoff, Cesc all played together and we absolutely tore Chelsea apart. 
And I think that was like one of the only times those four ever played together. And we thought, okay, this is it. This is the beginning of something new. The, this is just a warning, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I don't want to blurt it. Was, well, was, it was like one of the only times those guys played together. And then there was another one that was um, against Man United once. I think that was on the Wenger as well, still, where we blitzed them in the first sort of 12, 15 minutes. And I think we were like 3 0 up. I think Alexis scored a, a great goal. Mm. So, yeah, we, we, we did, you know, it's good to just have goals you know goal when you start when you start when you're solid it's all right you know you win one nil and all of that but when you add goals to your game it 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 takes the jeopardy away doesn't it where if you're one nil up anything can happen as we saw against burnley last week you you could get like a dodgy penalty decision or anything and you're literally just starting from scratch if you if you just go and blitz teams when they're down and that's what i love just we stood on their necks. They were down, and we said, "Okay, if you want to play like this, then we'll we'll finish you." And that's the ruthlessness that we have to look at as a team. And that that's hopefully that's the ruthlessness that Arteta was talking about at the end of last season. We have to be a ruthless team now. You know, if teams want to play rubbish against us, fine. Let's put them to the sword. Do you think, Danny, we were playing with a little bit the cliche phrase of handbrake off? Uh, I'm just looking back at the, the Chelsea results. Um, we beat them 5-3 at the bridge. And the season before that, we beat them 3-1 at home. I think that might be one you're on about because be we've one. lost the five games before that in all competitions and we didn't win for the next eight games after that. So we scored eight yeah. goals against them in two and then didn't <laughs> score again for ages, including that, that magical 6-0. Um, playing with a handbrake off, it's, it does make you wonder what... What has happened to Arteta to let this happen? Because basically all we've got is new defenders. We haven't, we've haven't. we still got the same midfielders. We've got the same strikers, wingers, whatever you want to call those players. So is it because he feels more secure to let us go out there and play free-flowing, one-touch, thanks, Josh, um, attacking football because he's now secure at the back and goes, right, the back is locked down. Off you go, play good football. I mean, that's just the only thing I can think. You're not in there for him. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That absolutely Fucking makes sense. Good night, everyone. I'm done. <laughs> no, that's that's seriously. If you, if you, you know what? Yeah, I looked at it at preseason. I saw that we were playing this crazy style of football in preseason, where it, it was Holden and Mari <laughs> were defending like absolute cycles. But I kind of said to myself, I said, okay, if you take out Holden and Mari, maybe there's a reason why we're playing this style. Of football, and you know what it is. We we when we defend higher up, we're actually a much better team. It, it just happens that Ch- Tottenham just we didn't need to defend high up to beat them. You know, we just let them come at us, and then like Carl said, we mistakes. just we just gave them a trap every time, and they fell into the trap a hundred yeah. times. But once he's you know, I saw, I thought okay, if he's got the two defenders, two centre backs that he trusts, and then you add. Um, Tommy at the back as well, kind of adding to that. You've got three defenders that you absolutely trust. It kind of gives a license to the rest of the team and a goalkeeper that the, the team trusts as well. So, yeah, no, you're, you're definitely spot on there, I would say. There you go, Carl. Should we say goodnight? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, definitely. I Even when we went into, the, into half-time, I was saying we could get literally five or six here. Mm. If they, I think they had to change it at half time. I remember my dad called me and he was saying, like, oh, what do you think? And I said, he's got to take Deli Ali off and put on a defensive player. I said, there's no way you can continue with him on the football pitch because it's just ridiculous. He's doing nothing up front and he's not defending. And I did say to my dad... stats from him. That there was a tweet going around about. Do you remember the tweet uh, and Ben? Because I can't. I've but it was seen it. Like all lots these zeros, of zero percent. Lots of zeros. Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm not crazy. surprised. Like he, he, what he was doing on football pitch, I had no idea. But um, when they changed it at half time, I did say, okay, they look a, probably a bit more stable in midfield now. They've got midfielders who will actually defend and they will actually try to keep the ball and not go gun ho. But even in the I expected Tottenham to kind of come out against us, but they never. They never really threatened us. They had a, a few chances, and I remember the only 
kind of one that sticks out in my head was the Harry Kane sort of uh, chance where he put it wide and the penalty uh, appeal, which I'll be very honest, it, it was a penalty. I don't think anyone could kind of argue because if it was at the other end, I would be definitely saying it was a penalty. So I think we kind of got away with one there. What do you but, think? Is... Oh, I was going to make another point, Carl. Go on. Go on, go on, go on. What do you think has happened to Deli Ali? Because... I'm looking back at his stats were amazing. His first season at Spurs, 15-16, 10 goals in 46 games. Next season, I don't know if someone's been mucking around on Wikipedia here, but 22 goals in 50 games, then 14 in 50. And then you come down to last season, 3 in 29. And then looking for England, in, in 16, 17 and 18, he played 30, 29 games for England with two goals. So is it is it every single manager recently? Uh, they've had all the um, uh, Nuno, then uh, Mourinho, Potocino, and then Sherwood. The only one under those that he played any good for was Potocino, I suppose. How can I that, think that he's only twenty five? The goals masked his performances. He wasn't that good. He just managed to pop up with goals <laughs> here, there, and everywhere. Now, if you watch Deli Ali play, I didn't think he was that. Good. Yes, he came up with goals brilliantly, and that that was sort of what he, I guess was on the pitch for. But you know, lovely the Mourinho effect as well. I think Jose Mourinho wanted him to do more, and he wasn't doing it. You know, Jose Mourinho is the sort of player, sorry, manager who you got to do everything. If you're a midfielder, you got to defend as well. You got to run wide and do everything. And Deli Ali wasn't doing that for Jose Mourinho, so that's why he dropped him, and that's why obviously his performances sort of tanked and obviously um Nunu wants him to do exactly the same thing as well he wants him to play in centre of midfield not in the number 10 role but in the centre and obviously when you play centre midfield you've got to do both things you've got to defend you've got to attack but Deli Ali doesn't want to do that he just wants to attack so I guess that's where he's kind of fallen off I mean there's talks of Tottenham trying to sell him in the summer or even in January, go back to them. I don't, I don't know who's going to buy him. Someone will, but to be honest, he could never score another goal for the rest of his life, and I wouldn't lose an ounce of sleep over it. And I don't <laughs> think anyone else um, here would. Um, Danny, I want to talk about Tommy Asu because since he's come in, for someone who doesn't have a position, he has been absolutely brilliant. Don't you think? I wasn't sure. I'd never like. Like, no, I've never saw, remember seeing Ben White play or Ramsdale play or any of these players. I've got a very bad memory for watching other people's teams. But at least I've heard of those. I've never heard of Tommy Ashu. And it, we were, it was meant to be either going for Emerson Royal of Barcelona, who ended up going to Spurs and then, then having his career ruined by um, Louis Zaha. Is it Louis Zaha? Is it Louis? No. No. Who's Wilf, Louis Zaha? Uh, oh, Louis Zaha was the, the striker. Wilf, Wilf, Wilf Zaha. Zaha. Wilfred Zaha, there you go. It's not even spelt the same, is it? I'm thinking, no, hold on, why am I picturing him in a red Man United? Actually, they did both play for Man United. That's where my brain was letting me down. Yeah, um, I forgot what you said now, Carl. Tommy Asu. <laughs> Tommy, Tommy Asu. Asu, yes. Never, so I remember thinking at the time, hold on, we got a bloke, according to Transfer Market, who um, plays at right centre-back and also plays at, um, at right-back. And I thought, oh, I'm not sure about this. So I actually tweeted and asked people. I said, well, why are we buying a bloke who hasn't got a defined position? What does that remind me a little bit of Callum Chambers? He can play in midfield, centre-back, right-back. And then I went and had a look at his YouTube. When people said he's really good, I had a look at his YouTube. And his YouTube was him running really quickly up and down the wing, him breaking up play. He loves a sliding tackle, which, which we all love, a sliding tackle. And I thought, well, this is going to be pretty good. But then I saw six foot two. How many decent right backs are six foot two? Then someone pointed out a really good right back who was six foot two, and then I just stopped tweeting about it and shut up. And then so now I've seen him play, but he he played another one who played in Belgium for for a season or so. But I'm just really impressed with the how he's got it. I think that's the easiest way to put it. How he's he's got the Premier League and he's got Arsenal so quickly. I mean, that's a sign of a really good player to come in, slot straight in. No kind of, well, we'll bring you on as a sub for a few games and you'll play a couple of League Cup games. No, straight in. You are number one right back. Sent, told Bellerin to get lost, who's uh, no, Betis and doing all right. 
but it's been really impressed with his work rate, his ability to get stuck in. His I didn't expect him to be able to get, get those crosses in. And like I said earlier, the, the partnership he's got with Saka on that right-hand side, that looks like they've been playing together for years. Really impressed and only 19 million quid. Fanta oh, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 I mean, sorry, the last fullback, I mean, I can remember coming in and having such an impact was uh, Bakari Sanya. You know, and he 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 wasn't. I I don't even think Bakari Sanya was as technically up to it as you know, because Tommy Ashley just left foot, right foot as well. He 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 glides with both feet. So he when like there's a couple of moves if you watch this game that you think he's going one way and he goes another way past a, a you know a Spurs player. You know, so technically really really you know proficient player like and um. Yeah, no, he, he, like you said, he gets forward when he needs to. He tucks in when he needs to. He covers, you know. And, and one thing that really helped was, if you notice, that Xhaka didn't have to keep dropping in to the centre-backs this time. So it didn't leave our midfield empty like Tottenham were leaving their midfield. We kind of had two solid midfielders. And, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about Xhaka more, but that, that kind of helped Xhaka's performance a lot, that he didn't have to keep shuffling around and dropping into the back three because Tommy Ashu was, was covering that space. I mean, I think it's testament that in a North London derby, Tottenham didn't start any of their new summer signings. Um, we started five. You know what I mean? It's, it's a case of Arteta now has his team and he's settled because, you know, for the first... I'm, uh, this is not me making excuses for Arteta because our first three performances of the season were absolutely dreadful but you know we played Brentford and you know I think it was hours before the game our two main strikers came down with COVID so we had to start a 19 year old up front which was not ideal definitely um we then played Chelsea and I'm not one of these people who say well they were European champions because we beat them twice in the season they became European champions so for me you know, that's neither here nor there. I mean, played Man City and, okay, Man City are Man City. I think we've been in Man City in the league for God knows how long. It's almost shocking, I guess. But um, now Arteta has his team. He's the way that he wants to play, the players he wants to play in the position. Do you see now that there's going to be um, a little bit of a change for me, that he now has a vision and the way that he wants to play will be done with his players. Yeah, look at it. Look at the, the team. If you go through the team, the, the Ramsell, he signed. Tommy Ashu, he signed. Uh, White and Gabriel, he signed. Tierney, gave a new contract. Xhaka, new contract. Party, he signed. Saka, Smith Rowe, new contracts. Erdegaard, he signed. Aubameyang, new contract. All from Arteta. So that is, that's his team. You know, there's and the players that that came on as well, apart from Maitland Niles, maybe. Uh, who who came on? Uh, Lokonga, that's Lokonga. his signing. Uh, Tavares, that's his signing. You know, Ainsley seems to have got his arm around him. So you know, he compared this to lot the, the last season at this time. You know, we had rumours of David Luiz and and um, his body going to Edu to ask for Arteta to be to, to be sacked. We had rumours of the Bundesliga bastards, as as Danny calls them, <laughs> <laughs> in the background causing mischief. You know, um, one of them is actually still there, but is nowhere to be seen. I saw him in the picture seen, actually. Yeah. That that big yeah. group picture. I saw him in that. Yeah. That, that, that well, I saw him today picture. when there was a picture of Xhaka and he was doing had his knee brace on a, on a bike and just in the corner on the other bike you could see <laughs> Kalasnich was there. Yeah. Oh, you know, I mean, Klasnic isn't a bad person. He just doesn't fit into the team yeah, that we yeah, play at the moment. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's because he was, I mean, look, he was never yeah. a fullback, wasn't he? He was never a fullback. He was like a wingback. A wingback. Yeah. And, yeah. and and that's the problem. We he can't. I don't think he can play in a flat back four. So yeah. that's why he yeah. never really fitted into the squad, which is just a little bit yeah. off. I mean. When we done the deal at the time, it made sense. You know, you the best left back in the Bundesliga at that time, four three. You know, you're thinking to yourself, "Oh my God, that like, he's going to come in and do wonders." But and he wasn't all bad, but it was just a case of run up the wing and cut back. 
That's all he ever did. Broke the wing and cut back. He had nothing else to his game. And I mean, yeah, unfortunately, if you're playing with um, the real my stuff in, like the C side and stuff in, as Danny calls him, um, it's you know any yeah. team with yeah. the stuff in the squad, he's not going to do well. If you'll have to constantly cover him, then it's wrong. But you know, um, yeah. but he's yeah, definitely uh, leave the season. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's still he's still like 27, 28, isn't he? He's still he's not like he's thirty. Even Mustafi's like twenty eight or something like that. So, you know, it, it it's just a shift in culture, a shift in you know. We're not hearing obviously at some point during the season we are going to start hearing about disgruntled players who are not playing because we're literally playing with fifteen to eighteen players, and and I can't. I kind of expected that that once we settle down that we're not going to make that many changes with no Europe this season, you know, a couple of cup games here and there, um, you know, FA Cup doesn't start till January. You might start hearing rumours of disgruntled players, but you know, when you're winning, the the whole squad is happy, I guess. It's going to have to be hard for Dan Chambers, Holding, and Mari, isn't it? Because you look at the, uh, Gabriel and White already, and you think those those three are so far off what those those two have done already in the last three or four games. They've got a part like everything is partnerships, isn't it? They they they're perfect together. You got White is the one who gets the ball, brings it out, and goes and gets the ball, and, and Gabriel is the one that goes in and uh, teaches people a lesson if they they misbehave with him. And that's you know what you, as you said that Danny that they're so far off. But wasn't it Tony Adams in the studio the other day? Um, going on about holding being if they swapped out holding for white it wouldn't make any difference that's what he was saying you know like but that's what makes me wonder about pundits whether they really watch the game or not whether (laughs) that's obviously nonsense (laughs) it is absolute nonsense well he's a shit manager bless him (laughs) we've been doing you know and i think that's something that that helps with the atmosphere as well you know around the, the club we've been doing the same players since Wenger was there, basically over and over again, trying to re restyle them, and <laughs> it's like trying to sell something that you've worn before. You, we've seen Holden, we've seen Chambers, and we've seen the same mistakes that they make over and over again. And then we still think, okay, maybe if we then combine them with this player, they'll get better. Oh, he's doing him. his best. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, holding. Yeah, he's he's doing it. You know, and they're not bad players. We will need them at some point. But once you say this is the players that I want, these are the upgrades of this player, and these players can come in. You know, you, you look at the famous Man United teams. They had players like John O'Shea and and Clayton Nicky Bot. Yeah, that would come in and do a job when they need to do. And that's what we, we have to aim for. You know, these players should be there to, to bolster up the squad, not to be starters. Luke Chadwick. <laughs> Ollie oh, yeah, yeah. He, was a, he was a super sub, wasn't he? He wasn't yeah. a regular. Another one. Oh, well, he definitely wanted to stay there. But um, <laughs> I think you're right. I think throughout the season, you are going to you know hear of some players being this one. I mean, you think how far away Callum Chambers is from that squad, even as a sub, what well, you wouldn't even think about bringing him on as a sub at all. And you well, think he's had about such a strange career, hasn't he, Carl? Because we got him in as a young man from Southampton, played a load of games, then sent him out on loan two seasons in a row, and finished Fulham, then Middlesbrough, and he looked like he was out and done. And then we come back again, and he's played a load of games, and now he's out again. You got to be thinking, but there again, like Femi was saying, Carl. That uh, we've got the League Cup games, which we're going to have a good run in the League Cup because we've got Leeds next. We'll beat those at home, and then we've got the FA Cup games to come. Plus, we're going to get injuries, and plus players are going to be maybe away on international duty and come back late. And they're, they're out, out of those defenders, Carl. What order would you put them in? The Mari Chambers holding, as if as if one of the other defenders dropped out. I mean, it, again, it does depend on what side as well, left or right, yeah. but. Um, I think you'd have to probably go Mari holding Chambers. Yeah, I think that's the, probably the order. I think, especially as he bought Mari, I think that's why Mari goes above holding. Yeah, but then, he, then, but then he gave Holden a new contract last year. Yeah, but we give people new contracts to protect their, <laughs> that means their work <laughs> before we sell them. So that, again, it does. It's that usually a right. kiss of death. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's true that like, it, it does mean nothing at all but 
surely Chambers must be thinking since I'm talking to his agent, thinking, you know, I'm not going to make it here. I have to leave now because I'm so far down the picking order. Now that um, he's, that he's not going to get right back either, is he? No, because you think Tommy Asu's there, and then yeah. who's the second choice right back? Is it Cedric? Is it Chambers? Um, well, it was Cedric in the cup game last week, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, so you Cedric think it's his last... as well, isn't he? Yeah, so Chambers must be thinking he, he's got to leave. Holding must be also thinking, you know, if I've got any aspirations um, to try and progress my career, am I leaving? But does he go to an, another Premier League squad? Does Or does he go to like a lower down, a Norwich, uh, a team like that who, who just come up, he's got Premier League experience? If, no, if you're holding, do you ask for... In, but even that, if you're holding, do you ask for a loan in the in the in the January transfer window? I think holding oh, will probably hold out to the end of the season. But Chambers, I could see him maybe asking for. I think Chambers could go to um, a Southampton and maybe a West Ham if because uh, he likes the the big players. Um, Moyes well, Chambers, and Moyes. Chambers is an interesting one because his contract is supposedly up. But Arsenal have an option to extend it. So have they taken? No one knows whether they've taken the option or they well, haven't. They would, they because... wouldn't have, was he's he's a fifteen twenty million pound player. It'd be crazy yeah. not to take up the option. Exactly. Well, no one. They haven't announced that they they signed him. So his contract's up at the end of the season. So it, it's it's all a bit of a strange one. That one. Yeah, that's a weird one. That's. Yeah, it, it, it's strange. Who, who knows with Arsenal? Arsenal are an enigma in themselves. Mm-hmm. I mean, you talk about a player we're going to talk about now uh, with Granit Xhaka, who was seemingly out the door in the summer, literally, you know, I think he almost had a Roma shirt on and suddenly he's, he's back in the fold and a, a new contract. And we just heard the news yesterday or whenever you're listening to this that, you know, he's out for three months with uh, knee ligament damage. Danny, t- Taking away the, our feelings about Granit Xhaka, how much of a blow is that to Arsenal? Well, I like him. I've always liked him. But I've always said that some of our fans, there's a very tiny minority, but some of them do need to be told to F off. Chris. Uh, but, but I do, I think he... <laughs> no. Um, but he, um, he does he does a job. But it's always... But the problem has been with him, like Femi was saying earlier, that when we uh, when the, uh, Arteta's plan was give the ball to Tierney, he'll run down the left. Xhaka, you fill in at the left. Oh dear, we've got our one man in midfield. We've got El Nenny in midfield trying to take on three midfielders. That's, that's not going to work. And so that doesn't happen anymore. And he's got party with him. And we've seen with Lukongo, who seems like a really good player. And so you've got now got a few options there. And he has leadership skills. I mean, you look at him for Switzerland. Plays a different role. Hopefully, he'll be able to play that role for Arsenal. Because for Arsenal, he has been effectively a defensive midfielder who goes to the back two, gets the ball off them, brings it forward, and is having to do all this work himself. But for Switzerland, he didn't do that. It's more likely he'd be the central midfielder they give the ball to, and then he can pass it around like he does to us. Because you look at his passing stats, they're really good. They're quite accurate as well. So I'm happy that he's he's um, he's back in the squad. I don't think he'll be out for three months because the man, much like Oleg Luzhny, he heals like a dog. <laughs> I think that was that used to say that on the on the Tuesday club, uh, a heel like dog. <laughs> so it's good, but we're going to need them, aren't we? Because in in January we've got the African Cup of Nations, and we are going to lose Party Um I'm not going to do what uh, someone did, uh, what Mike did on the Gooners pod, and had uh, Lukonga down as. Um, as going to the African Cup of Nations, because I don't think Belgium are going, are they? <laughs> no. I, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> yeah, that would be strange. So poor old Mike. <laughs> so you're he lose got about an two L- players you're losing Elneny as well. Yeah, yeah and... so that's, I mean, field kind of also gone. So you're thinking to yourself, I mean, is Elneny still injured? I can't even remember. No, no he's he back. Is. He was on the bench. In, I don't think we have any injuries other than Xhaka. No, yeah, we don't have any injuries. Oh, he just hasn't, so he just hasn't played, so... They're well, saving him definitely... for a special occasion. Yeah, well, he's gonna. He was obviously gonna play soon because, I mean, even against Brighton, you're thinking, would it be the Congo and Party in the middle? I mean, we are one Party injury away from a um, the Congo and Elneny midfield, aren't we? That, that um, ball Party did to Young's feet. 
My yeah. God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I nearly <laughs> cried when he did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you ever said, when was the last time we had a player in his own half that could lob the ball onto the foot of the flat out of Bunyan? <laughs> How did he, 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 he? It's the Matrix, isn't it? That's what it is. We're living in a Matrix. It's all a, a Matrix. Impossible. It was a, an extremely good pass. But, Femi, what do you think about the, the Brandon Shakir injury? Do you think he's going to be a massive miss? Because obviously, Arteta likes him, you know, straight into the squad. But as soon as he comes back from uh, his suspension, do you think he's going to be a, a great loss for if he is out for the three months? I think I think it's the big unknown for Arteta, isn't it now? Because Granit Xhaka's literally are ever present in all in since he's been there. He's literally probably only missed games through suspension, one game here or there. He's hardly ever been dropped. And one player that will miss him definitely is Kieran Tierney. Because I as soon as this game started, I said Kieran Tierney just as soon as Xhaka plays, he just looks like a different player. He he just he he's got someone there who just always feeds him the ball. Someone there who, like Danny says, will will happily shuffle to the left and cover for him. You know, it, it's it's quite um, so. Tierney will definitely miss him. I think. You know, I'm not. I'm like a fifty-fifty on Jack. I'm just like sometimes I'm. I'm like Danny. I'm like oh, yeah, Jack is good. Sometimes I'm like. How Jeff was on the show last week. Well, I'm not having him. <laughs> I'm not having him. <laughs> um, yeah. So sometimes you know he's, but I can see his importance for the team. So I think, we'll, and obviously numbers wise, we'll definitely miss him because you know Maitland Niles, Lakonga, and Elneny are now you know shuffling around to to be the number two to party. You know you got to kind of protect party as well. Or is he going to do what he did against Burnley more often, which is basically stick Erdegaard there, kind of with Smith Rowe hovering around there as well? Is he going to try and do that more in more games? You know, that that's I, might be an option. I would be open to that. A, a, a party Smith Rowe and Odegaard midfield. I mean, you tell Partey just to. I mean, Partey is not a defensive midfielder, let me make this clear, and I understand this, but you tell Partey just to sit, be a deep-lying um, playmaker, and you tell Odegaard and smith to run. Let them do the attacking. And I'd be absolutely happy with that, with Pepe and Saka on the wings and feeding Aubameyang. I, I, I think that there is times that we will play like that against teams. Um, yeah. Teams that, you know, are, who are going to be maybe easily broken down and we can just not sacrifice um sort of almost sacrifice defending per se but i'm not going to ask need an excuse to do that but we can just go sort of all out attack blitz teams and i think that's definitely a, a time that we we definitely do that but i'm hoping that towards now on the end of january and towards january when obviously el nene goes and party goes and Pepe goes and Aubameyang goes. We don't have any more injuries. It's inevitable we are going to pick up knocks and things like that. It's going to happen, there's no doubt about it. But I think for Arsenal having such a big squad, it's almost like we've taken out Xhaka and it's kind of like a big piece of Arsenal that's kind of missing. And Arteta and Nina has to feel that Granite Xhaka size piece of, of the puzzle to continue Arsenal to play. I mean, going away to Brighton, Josh's second team, or maybe first team, we don't know. We're still undecided about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be an easy game either. I mean, Brighton have been brilliant this season so far. They've been absolutely, you know, I felt sorry on Monday for Crystal Palace, where it's literally the last kick of the game. and um, They managed to get an equaliser. So that was... I still find it weird that, that Brighton and Crystal Palace is a derby. I really, really find that all... I think it's it's for the lack of um, other opponents, isn't it? I have no idea, but I still think it's just very weird that we move anyway. I think you should, we, you should get Josh to give you the, the history on that. You'll probably know. There's there's some <laughs> fight in history with the two friends or something like that. I don't know. The Battle of Wellington or something. 
because they've probably got birds on their um, <laughs> on their parties. I don't know about that. So I think along their lines. But how about man of the match, Carl? Because oh, you see, you you breathe again. I'm not used to that. I'm not used to people oh, breathing no, no, no. and then stopping. Sorry. For me, it was Smith Rowe. I think Smith Rowe was absolutely brilliant in that game in, against Tottenham because he just didn't stop running and. You know, for a young guy who, you know, he, he's paid his dues. He went out on loan to Huddersfield. He, did he need to? Probably, yes. Just to learn yeah. to how to play football week in and week out as well. Didn't moan. He came back, got his chance, and he's taken it. And I think at the end, when he had his interview, he was saying that this is what he's dreamt of, you know, scoring against Tottenham at home with his family in the crowd. That's what you want to hear from someone who's grown up through the academy, coming through, got his chance, and playing against your bitter rivals and scoring with your family in the crowd. That's what every single person at Hayden End should be watching Smith Rowe thinking, I can do that. Now, I can actually go on to do that. So for me, it was definitely Smith Rowe. What about you, Danny? Odegaard. We haven't mentioned Odegaard so far on this podcast. I was waiting for one of you two to mention. Or you, I think one of you did a little bit. We've been pulling the strings, but... The amount of, I know it's Femi saying you shouldn't give him space, I think you said, Fem, but he was just magnificent. Everywhere you looked, he was there. Every little bit of space, he was there. He's pulling passes. He's, 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 at times, he was playing the the central midfield, the attacking midfield, and then, like I was saying earlier, with Smith Rowe will come in, he'll go out wide. The only place he didn't really spend much time was out on the right where Saka was. Leg and Saka is so fantastic. You you just say, oh, that, that area is yours. You, you, you go wild with it all. But Odegaard, I think, is the one key thing in the, that we're now scoring goals. We saw there was a stat that said in the games against um, Norwich, Burnley and uh, Spurs, we had the most number of shots shots or shots on target or shots, whichever one it was, in, a, in three consecutive Arsenal League games since 2017, I think the stat was. And I said at the beginning of the season, now we have got someone, we've got people who score goals, and we've got people who can defend. We just need someone in the middle that can create those chances. In the first part of the season, we had no chances, no no anything. And then Odegaard comes in and he starts working his magic, like we saw last season, where he straight away he came in and he was brilliant. And now we can see why he's uh, the Norwegian captain, Norwegian wonder kid, why Zidane was his favourite player and he wanted to go and play for Zidane at Real Madrid. You can see why we're not saying he is a Zidane, but the only part of the game that he he could possibly improve on would be maybe scoring goals because he is doing absolutely everything. And he is, for me, probably along with Ramsdale, the most important, irreplaceable player that we've got in the squad. Everyone else, to a certain degree, can be replaced from the odd game or two. But if Odegaard was out for three or four games, I don't think there's anybody else who can come in there and do the job that he does. You don't think that Smith Rowe could play where Odegaard plays? He can play there. But I don't think he's got the vision and the experience that Odegaard has got. Especially, I mean, Odegaard's 22, 23, Norwegian captain already. Loads of Norwegian caps. He, he's he played for Zaragoza. He, Zaragoza, he's played for Real Madrid. He, he, he's been on loan to Raza. I think he was on loan at a, a Belgian, no, a Dutch team. Um, was it AZ? He was on loan at someone like that. And he's been magnificent. So he's, been, he's played in so many countries at such a young age. All that wisdom and experience just shows. And... I think uh, Smith Rowe will learn off of him and hopefully try and emulate the try and cut the player he is. But I think Odegaard's a more attacking player. I mean, Smith Rowe's a more attacking player. We can expect more goals from Smith Rowe. But Odegaard is just an absolute delight to have a maestro in midfield there. Kind of almost Cesc ish at times, just passing the ball around everywhere. One step ahead of everyone else and know and re- his ability to read the game. It is, I'm just watching it thinking, my God, that bloke is fantastic. What do you think is the minimum amount of goal you expect from? I say I put Saka in there as well. From first from Saka, Odegaard, and Smith Rowe, what's the minimum amount of goals you expect from those three? Who are you asking? Both of you. <laughs> there you go, Fem. Um, uh, I don't know. Saka got like six. It's not. They're not. The... To be fair, if they start if they start more games, they have to score more goals. Um, I would expect sort of sixes and yeah, six, probably twelve to fifteen. I'd say me that's me being generous because I, I you know like Danny said, Odegaard doesn't really 
get into the box on the end of moves. He's more the, the starter of a move. So he's like the, the pass before the pass, whatever they call it, pre-assist, whatever they call it. Um, Saka gets in good positions, but his finishing can let him down sometimes. But I guess that will come. And it's really interesting that Saka just seems to always play better on the right. So we've kind of got a decision to make there. You know, do you stick him back on the left now? <laughs> you know, and bring Pepe back on the right because he always performs on the right and he's like 50 50 whether he performs on the left or not. And then uh, Smith Rowe, I, I think Smith Rowe will get a. Yeah, I think I, I think he should be aiming for a good eight eight goals this season. Why not? If he's playing more games, why not? He's he'll he'll, he'll get six to eight goals. Um, Saka probably six goals. Erdegaard maybe four or five. You know, if he's taking three kicks like he did last week, he might could mm. get more. I'm hoping so. Dan, what about you? I'm just looking at the stats here because I think you can tell a deep like with Willock. Willock's progression was scoring goals in the League Cup then in Europe, and then you start scoring them in the league because as the quality goes up, then you start to score. Hopefully, you'll see the goals being scored against all of those things. That's when players get their chances. But Saka last season in the Premier League got five in 32. And that was a season when we were struggling. But he's, uh, there was a fraud. I mean, it's 96 games he's played. No, yeah. Oh, yeah, 96 games for Arsenal, 13 goals. And a lot of those have, uh, have come in other competitions, not just the Premier League. He's got four in Europe. He's got one in the League Cup and one in the FA Cup. So if last season he got five in 32, I think we he's probably going to play maybe th- around 32 good Premier League games this season. Even if he has the same season he did last season and he gets five, I think I'd, I'd be happy with that. He can score more. And then looking at Smith Rowe, he's, um, he's scored uh, nine goals for Arsenal, but he's done it with Europe. He's got three. In the League Cup, he's got two. In, in the FA Cup, he's got one. And last season, he got two in 20 in the Premier League. So, like Fem was saying, I think if either of those two can get six or seven in the Premier League, and then the rest of the goals will be from Odegaard setting up Aubameyang to to score, and hopefully setting up Lacazette to score. We've got a few set pieces, people that can do stuff from there. But it wasn't that long ago, Carl, that we were going, our entire midfield wouldn't score 10 goals a season, all competitions between all of them, would it? This would be between the, the end of Urzel being any good. And now, to go a top Premier League side, which is what we, we should be, to all of our midfielders together don't get 10 goals. We used to have midfielders who would get 10 goals on their own a season. So can you see that happening again? Yes, I, I can see us scoring much more goals if... Again, the cliche comes if we take the handbrake off a little bit. If we let the players play and literally play that brilliant attacking, free flowing French Josh uh, football that we that you know we can do because, like you said, we have the defenders now where we can say to the defenders. I mean, I'm not saying that the midfielders shouldn't defend. We don't do a Tottenham, but you know, uh, we've got confidence in our defense that. If they do attack, uh, another team attacks, then we can sort of stop it. And we don't have the Mustafi thinking, oh, shit, there's going to be a mistake here because it's him playing. Or we don't have uh, a goalkeeper who can have confidence in. And that's not me saying, I'm going to talk about Ramsdale in a minute, but that's not me saying I didn't have the confidence in Leno. But, you know, Ramsdale being in there gives me a bit more of assurance than it did when Leno was there. So unfortunately, um, that's why he's lost his place in the squad. But I think that we have to trust our midfield. We have to play to the strengths of our best player, which is Aubameyang. You know, you don't want him out on the left, like you said, Danny. You want him up front, scoring goals, providing him with, you know, brilliant balls in behind, cutbacks, all of those, and you want the likes of Smith Rowe, Odegaard, Pepe, Saka to run on to the end of things as well. I mean, just saying those names as well, you're thinking to yourself, we've got those players in our squad. There's no way that we should be not winning games that, you know, previously we've lost or previously we didn't have a chance of winning. So for me, we have to... I don't know. We we have to have faith in, in the team. We have to have faith to think that in games coming up, well, after the Europe, after the um, international break, we've got them thick and fast. And 
there's a handful of games that we should win, no matter who we play. I mean, we've got the two hardest games out the the way, per se, which is Chelsea and obviously Manchester City. But after that, you know, I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know if you got it up, but I'll have a look quickly of our fixtures after the... Um, We've got Brighton away. So we've got so we've got Brighton away. Then we've got Crystal go. Palace home. We should be beating Crystal Palace at home. Aston Villa at home is a tricky one because Aston Villa are not poor. But Do you know Martinez? A, Aston Villa goalkeeper really. used to play for Arsenal. Did he? <laughs> he's he's never mentioned that at all in the slightest. Villa so, have been playing really well, to be fair. They've exactly, really... they've got. So I'm not going to say that that's just an easy win, but we've got three home games in the bounce, which is Crystal Palace, Aston Villa, and obviously. Leads in the league cup, which we should win that. Let's we're, we're, we're playing on a Monday and a Friday, which I don't think I've ever seen before. Both back to back home games. So Palace is on a Monday Jeez, night, yeah, yeah, and Villa's on a Friday night. Why it is really weird they that us, how, they, why they us dirty? how they worked that out, yeah, it's, that's really weird, especially with both teams having no European football. Why did they not put us on a Saturday? Or Sunday, we yeah. Are, we yeah. are the attraction team now, aren't we? They just move us around wherever they need to get big figures because we've got bugger else to do with our time. <laughs> but that is really weird because even the Palace game on the Monday, why is that not on the Sunday? Like, yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's really weird. I don't know why it's started. Man, it'd be interesting like to go back and look at this the Chelsea season when they were out of Europe and Liverpool and see, and when they're out of Europe and see if they were playing games all over the place because I bet they probably weren't. Yeah, probably not, weird. yeah. That's weird. Um, and then Leicester, we've got Leicester away, which is always going to be a tricky one. Leicester are not playing brilliantly this season. Yeah, they lost the game. Yeah, so and then Watford home and then Liverpool away. So Danny, out of those games, so I'm going to do it quickly. So Brighton home, Brighton away, Danny, win or lose. We were going to draw that, and it is going to be quite an entertaining game. And Jeff Arsenal is meeting up with like, with our Josh. Well, our, our Jeff Arsenal is meeting up with our Josh, so it's going to be a good game. If you're there and you see a shifty, opaque bloke with six foot tall, lanky and ginger, that would be Josh. <laughs> Femi, Pat is home, which I'm going to, which with Jeff as well. Um, oh, look at Jeff rubbing rubbing knees. That's not a saying, is it? I'm going to shut up now. Okay. Rubbing shoulders. Is That's it. You know what that is? Because I'm doing the the, the, um, the JPEG for our podcast, and I'm just uh, moved a bit. This is a knee slide. So uh, there you go. Sorry, carry on. Right, uh, Sammy, at home. What do you think? We should. Yeah, no, we we'll, we we'll, we should we should be all right there. We should. We should be able to win that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Danny, yeah. But now we're Aston Villa. Danny, Aston Villa. At home on a Friday after the game on the Monday, which is again very weird. Um, I'm going to say we're going to win that because we're at home. They've had their best player taken off of them, and Martinez might forget which team he's playing for because he used to play for Arsenal apparently, and he he might let in uh, a goal or attack the wrong end, go up for a corner. So fingers crossed. <laughs> we over the one. They've beaten us the last three games in a row. They have been lucky. Definitely old old M one now. Well, they yeah, they did double over us yes, last season, which was mm-hmm. they battered us at home, didn't they? Three one, wasn't it? Three nil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they absolutely battered us. Um, Leeds in the League Cup, Danny, are we beating Leeds? Yes, Leeds can't afford to put out a really strong team. Although you would think that they would probably be hopefully be going for to try and go for one of the cups because they're not going to win the league. But they uh, they've had a bit of a bad run of results recently, haven't they? They've not they've not been doing that well. So yeah, I think we'll beat them. Have they Plus won a league home. game this season? They haven't, have they? I think they have been quite unlucky. Lots of goals, yeah, but they have they they played really. I've been watching them a lot actually because I've been having these debates about the way they play. They play really really good football, mm. but they just cannot defend. They've let in a. I, I think that. They've let in the most shots in one of the most shots in all of Europe. They've so taken like over a hundred, yeah, over like a hundred <laughs> and something shots in like five games. It's absolutely Jeez. ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's mad. How do you think we're going to do in those Carl? So I think we will draw with Brighton. I think we'll beat Crystal Palace. I think we'll 
be Aston Villa, it would be Leeds and Leicester away. I think we might come and suck against Leicester away if I'm being yeah, Leicester are rubbish though. We did yeah, really, really are, we've done really well at Leicester. I think Leicester away last season was our best performance. I it was, that. I do, yes, it was a very good performance. Yeah. It's just we're a top ten team now, Carl. Top ten. We're not we've got a positive outlook on life. Yeah, we'll see. And then Watford home, I think, is we should. But they're playing that decent game. football, surprisingly, because they've just come up. No Troy Deeney. That's always a plus for us. It is. Um, he took his cojones to Birmingham. <laughs> so yeah, and I think again, and then we've got sort of Liverpool after that. So away, which let's be honest, that's probably the trickiest yeah. one. So yeah, good night, as good long time. as we. As long as we have the team settled, there's quite a few wins there where we can plough ourselves up the table. And I think that's what we need because, Femi, as you saw, like a win can just change the whole atmosphere around the club. You're always going to have those people who are just never going to be happy. We could win every single game between now and the end of the season and teams would not be happy at all. It's just one of those things. I'm sorry, people will not be happy, but, you know, positive results changes the whole outset of Twitter. I mean, could you imagine if we had lost in North London Derby, how the fan base would have been? But look how happy everyone's been this Get week. Everyone has been, <laughs> everyone has been joyous this week. And, you know, everywhere they go, Tottenham get battered because even the, the ladies' team <laughs> lost to That's Arsenal. Yeah, the ladies' team lost to... Um, so, oh, well. so we brilliant like so that's just the whole club is in a state of euphoria and don't you think that that's what arsenal needs sorry i'm just watching william saliba um and mate Genduzi getting in a a big fight <laughs> what, what crazy. Crazy. no 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 uh marseille are playing galatasaray and uh it seems like oh, yeah, it's, it that's... seems like there's been a lot of fireworks in this game between the fans, the players. Saliba's totally lost it. To be fair, he's he's seen red here, and uh, who's 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 the big hair person that you see coming in to help him? Of course, it's Skenduzi. <laughs> so that's you would want nothing. <laughs> you really would want nothing more, would you, like, than him coming in and uh, and fighting? That's uh, that, what. what? <laughs> I'm going to touch on him really quickly. Do you see Guendouzi back at Arsenal at all next season? No. No. I, I I just don't see it because I just think there's too much that's happened. As long as Arteta's there, he can never play for Arsenal. I, I think even as long as Edu's there from reports of some of his antics in Dubai at the you know last January, I, I just don't see that happening at all. Some of the coaches apparently he had arguments with, so it's, it's not going to happen. To be fair, um, he's been called up to the France squad as well, so he's clearly playing well for I'm Marseille. Even, though, which is mad, isn't it? even though he's a little prick, you know, he, he seems to have <laughs> something that people like, you know, a fire about him. But you know, that, um, back to the, the 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 performance. You know what? I've had that song ring only today. That song is just, <laughs> and now you just put it back in my head. Thank you. <laughs> Song has been ringing in my head for the whole week. <laughs> Don't you, it's it's quite weird actually because um, during that middle period of the Emirates, we they weren't we weren't really creative with the the new songs, were we? In the in the stadium, it was always just take a song and, and the only two original songs I ever heard was the Giroud song and Santi Cazorla song. That was it. Everything else, mm, it was just take a song and repackage it and now all of a sudden I'm hearing some new songs a Saka Smith Roll song uh Tommy Asu's taking on the um the Rosicky song actually that one? <laughs> Super Tom Super Tommy Asu. How about the, the Kieran Tierney he come from the, uh, Scotland oh, I've never heard for... that to be fair oh, <laughs> I've only heard that on the on the show but now I've never heard that you've got the Tottenham song ringing everywhere Aaron Ramsdale's got his own song you know, so the, the fans are warming to some of these these players, you know, and I think it's one of those ones where we, we've always said, you know, if we see the passion and the quality, the fans will always 
support the, the players. I think there's, you know, it's time to drop all the agendas. You know, there's some people that actually have an agenda and want Arsenal to lose sometimes to prove their point. And it's, I just think, like, do you just want to be, like, do you not want to have weeks like this every week? Do you just want to be miserable all the time? Some do. You know, it, they make a living nah, but it it's on just, YouTube. Yeah, but then what's the point of watching football if that's your plan? Like, it will actually drive you crazy if your team loses all the time. Like, I had to, I had to detach from Arsenal at some point in the past because I was like, I can't live like this because I can't have results you know, affecting yeah, <laughs> your, your whole weekend, you know. It was, yeah, I used to do that. Like, I would ruin my whole weekend if, if Arsenal lost. And then at yeah. some point, you have to just think to yourself, whether they win or lose, they don't care about me. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to care about them. So you need to. I mean, Danny, before we go into listeners' questions. Yep. <sighs> We, we'll probably say this after every podcast, but what, where do you see Arsenal at the moment finishing after? I mean, people can say it's only um, Norwich and it's only Burnley, but those games we played well. Yes, we've only scored one goal in, in two of those. Yeah, but I'm saying, like, in two of those games, we only scored one goal, and obviously Spurs, we blitzed okay. them in the first half. But where do you see... Arsenal finishing this season, if we carried on, I mean, obviously, if we carried on like we are, we'd be unbeaten, but there's going to be slip-ups <laughs> along the way. There's going to be slip-ups along the way. There's no doubt about that. So, can you see us getting into the top six, or is that too ambitious? Yes, because one of the big um, ones against us last season was Everton, you know, the Everton revolution, where they're buying all the world's best players and playing big money and getting big... Oh, hold on. Ancelotti's left. Rodriguez had, has had a sex change and, and moved to the Middle East. Uh, according to some Liverpool fans, I think that's what's happened. But we have <laughs> West Ham have got Europe to contend with, which is going to make them not quite so good. Man United, although they've got the world's best player, they are still hindered by their manager, who's, who's a fucking idiot. Chelsea have, have shown already that they are beatable. There is ways you can beat Chelsea. Um, as, as Man City did at the weekend, apparently it was quite easy. Man City still playing football without using a striker, which I, don't know, I never thought I'd see the day where they'd do that two seasons back to back. The worrying thing is that Liverpool, who I honestly thought in a top four of Liverpool, Man City, Chelsea, Man United, I thought Liverpool would be the one that could possibly drop off with all their players getting older. Um, uh, old white teeth, what's his name? Firmino, he's dropped back a little bit into midfield, not really scoring many goals now that Jot is in the team. And and generally, they weren't playing as good a football as they were two seasons ago. Well, this season, that's changed. Top of the Premier League, on by only by one point. They're, they're doing all right in Europe. They smashed someone, was it 5-2 the other day? They, they really look like they could be the team that are going to fight City for the title because Chelsea have always got a complete and utter um, collapse in them. And outside of Liverpool, Man City and Chelsea, I don't really see anybody else, unless Man United get a new manager. I don't really see anyone else in there because Spurs are shit now. Uh, Everton are, are, aren't much anymore. This is the season where we could go in and coincidentally we've got no European football, so we've got the long rests, maybe losing to, to in the league the league cup to leeds that might be not the, the worst thing that could happen to us that's just one less competition because remember we get to the semi-final of that, that that's going to be two um two legs and then the final is going to be held in late february early march so then that's going to be a busy time of the season for us so i'm not sure if we want to really want to get that far but at the way we're playing at the moment going by like, the games you've mentioned and you could see against norwich and burnley we were creating chances against spurs created and scored the chances I think we could possibly push for fifth, definitely sixth. And you never know, Carl, maybe even top four. Uh, maybe even fourth, not top four. So I think four, <laughs> one, six, where we should uh, you, You're very ambitious, Danny, and I, and I <laughs> like, I, I do like your outlook on life. You're very, uh, you say ambitious, Carl, I like to call it delusional. <laughs> a little from column A, a little from column B, I guess. Uh, it's uh, it's lovely. But Femi, where do you think the Arsenal... If he says finish? 10th, I'm going. No, no, no. I had our six when we did our predictions at the, the start of the season. And I haven't changed my mind. Um, well, who's, what's still... the five teams better than us? 
Oh, I think the top four is going to be pretty hard for us to catch. Yeah. I mean, realistically, Liverpool, I didn't expect to start off the way that they have. And they have just... Uh, I'll be really interested to see Liverpool's level when they play City on Sunday because Liverpool have just shot off like a... I, I don't even know. Like, they, like I watched their game against... I know Porto went up too much, but they absolutely stuffed Porto, you know, away. Um, United. It's like they've had a season of furlough, isn't it? They've yeah. they've, got, they've had a couple of seasons have really been on it. They've had a season going, oh, I can't fucking be bothered. And now they've, they've had a rest and they're back on it because yeah, we know exactly. Klopp at Dortmund killed all these players by making them do too much. Got the hundred and one percent out of them for three seasons, then they all died. Yeah. And maybe he's found a way around it. How Liverpool, I don't know how Liverpool are good because I, I can't actually say okay, this is an extraordinary thing that they do. They just they just play well and then uh united are just united you know as we saw yesterday they were awful yesterday they got absolutely uh, emery's team destroyed them it should have been like four nil at one point and they've just got fergie time on their side they've got ronaldo in their team so no matter how bad Solskjaer is they've just got firepower and star power and yeah the other two you know chelsea city and then, um, to be fair, we could finish fifth. But, yeah, I had us down for sixth. I, I haven't seen anything to change my mind. West Ham are annoying, to be honest. Annoyingly good. But they can't cope with... They've got a team of half-decent players, no actual stars. They ain't going to be able to cope with Europe and that, are they? And they're, they're, he's going to... I reckon Moyes would put, get all of his eggs, put them in the basket of European football because they're never going to do anything in the league, are they? You really have to go... What, and... what, if, what if they won the Europa League and went in the Champions Good. League? I'd love that. <laughs> I'd love to win. As long as that league makes a path for us to finish fourth, fifth, I'm going fifth. How about you, Carl? I, I, I want to be optimistic. I, I do, and I want to be positive. Do it. I did it. It felt liberating. It's like taking it, it does, but sometimes optimistic, but you need to be realistic as well, yeah, Daniel. Um, and you're saying, are there four better teams than us? You have to put the four Chelsea, Man United, yeah. Liverpool, um, and Man City. They are better than us. Um, and then you come down to that the other level, and then it's the West Ham, Leicester level where you know you're thinking I mean I personally think that Nunu will be fired from Tottenham this season he doesn't make it to the end of the season I can assure you of that um and we need to mix up I think the the one game a week does help us however we just need to be consistent I think consistency is probably one of the hardest things for Arsenal to maintain we need to make sure that Injuries aside, we carry on playing the football that we're capable of. We carry on. Arteta doesn't sort of stop us playing in the way. As I think Arsenal will only be their own worst enemies. No other team will beat Arsenal apart from Arsenal beating themselves. That's what happened. Remember the games last season? We will be playing well, but Arsenal will be the, the own worst enemies. Having 20 shots on goal not scoring one and then losing one nil to a stupid mm. team and for no reason whatsoever. And I think we need to stop that. So I'm going to go six because I still think there's one of those random teams that will just be in there. Maybe not be better than us, but they'll be more consistent than us because do you remember the season that Leicester won it and everyone's saying, oh, Leicester won't win it. They won't maintain it. They won't maintain it. They were just going on doing what they were doing one game a week. Their basic brand of football, which was not the ball <laughs> to Vardy and Vardy will run on and score. I mean, in that season, we were the only team to beat them home and away, only team to do a double over them. And which was mad. And like I said about Liverpool, Liverpool have surprised everyone. I'm not saying Liverpool was shit because they're not, but I think. The way Liverpool are playing, no one expected them to kind of be as good as they are this season. So I think that's the top four is kind of set in stone. And then after that, it's the best of the rest. And I think we are in that mix of best of the rest as long as we can maintain consistency with the results and, and how we play. 
All right, Daniel, do you want to get some listeners' questions up? I have, um, I did like them on Twitter. Oh, yeah, I've got them all. Oh, see? I... No, it's wonderful. Shall I ask them? Go ahead, Daniel. All right, start with you. For Matt L. Roberts, who sent us two, he says, uh, is the start of Mikel's unbeaten run, in quotes, similar to Unai's when he started? Um, I'm hoping so. Um, I don't mind having that one nil victory. If I remember um, when Jace was on here and he was saying that the results and the performance didn't match each other. I'm kind of in the region of I don't really care about. We could play absolutely dog shite football, but if we're winning games, does anyone remember how we played apart from the result? No one, you know, you don't get points for playing well. You get points for winning games. So, for me, you as long as we're winning games and we are going to get a hiccup somewhere along the line, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. But what I don't want is if we're playing well. It'll be, sorry, if we're winning games and we do have a hiccup somewhere, I don't want the whole fan base to kind of switch and then be like, "Oh God, it's all doom and gloom again." Because we've shown that we can go on a, on a run. So for me, as long as we, again, consistency, consistency is such a word to use, but we have to maintain um, a good run of form. And if Arteta does bring us on like a 22-game run without losing, I'll be very happy. Extremely so happy. We need if to we be went, consistent. If we went on consistent. A, yeah, if we went on a 22-game unbeaten run, yeah. we would probably be first or second in the league the way that the league is set up this season, the way teams are just beating each other left, right and centre, <laughs> any team that puts together that type of run, no matter what the performances is, we would we would be top two by the time that run came to an end. So, you know, let's 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 hope we could let Brighton will t- tell us a lot about this team. Mm. All right, question for both or all three of us um, from El Guna. Which Arsenal player would you go for a drink with and why is it Aaron Ramsdale? <laughs> <laughs> Have you, you two got one? And is it Aaron Ramsdale? Well, I don't uh, drink. From, so I, not, don't really not, like I don't drink. really drink myself, but for me, yeah. it would probably be... I'll probably go with either Saka or... Kieran Tierney. I don't know why. I just feel like Kieran Tierney would just be funny. Just yeah, but he'll get you into a fight. And because you're no, six just, eight, he'll expect you to do the hard work. I feel like Kieran Tierney would just be funny. Just like he's the sort of player. You know, there's people in your life that are funny without even trying to be funny. I feel like that's Kieran Tierney. And Saka, because I just I would just love to just talk to him just to see. <laughs> And no, wouldn't Saka and Smith Rowe, the way they talk, you know, years ago we had the Estuary English accent, and then you got the only way is Essex accent. Now you've got their accent. Doesn't that doesn't that grate on you a little bit? Much like um, Scouse accent. Leave them alone. They're young guys, like they're just oh, enjoying themselves. Out of it. Um my one, while well, you're thinking of yours, Sammy. Yeah. Not that I really want to meet him, but it'd be Ben White, and I'd just send selfies of me and him to... Uh, well, not selfies. Selfies is on your own. I'd send a picture of me and him every five minutes all the way through the day to Josh. <laughs> and I'd get him to sign a port a, a Portsmouth. Bloody hell. See, this is what happens, Carl. My brain doesn't do what I tell it to do. A Brighton kit, and I'd get him to sign it and uh, sign it to Josh and framed, and then he'll have to have it off the, the back of every show that he does for us. But yeah, yeah, I'd, Sign I'd, from I'd the seaside, the stuffy. Oh, yeah. oh, God, it'd be another interesting one. Obama Young just go in his car. Oh, I couldn't, you couldn't wedge me in his car. You need three grown men and a tub of Vaseline to get me in any of his Lamborghinis. Here's uh, a full listeners. <laughs> um, I, I go with part, Thomas Party, man. I've seen some of the parties that he goes to, man. That's that's my kind of party, my kind of the company that he seems to keep at these parties as well. <laughs> Um, yeah. Oh, you don't see. Oh, you probably, you there, haven't seen, no, you don't. You see the pictures of Thomas having yeah. a good time. No. Thomas goes to festivals and all sorts. Yeah, I see him at festivals and <laughs> yeah. Oh. He's he's definitely into his 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 music and he knows clearly knows a few artists. So to go with him, get in the backstage, keep some good company, man. 
Well, I hate music, so that'd be no good for me. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a pretty good question. Um, cheers, uh, El Guna, whatever your real name is. Right, stupid one here from Eddie, the legend Longbridge. Hello, Eddie. Thank you very much for all of your um, wonderful bits of art you do. And I, I struggle to, if you call it art, and I struggle to keep up with the number of accounts that you have because you, he's got them in German, in French, in Spanish, in everything. Um, like I say, Eduardo, if it was uh, maybe Brazilian, Eduardo Longbridge is loads. Anyway, he says, uh, should Mikel Arteta, Carl, field the same 11 against Brighton as he did against Spurs, or is it unnecessary to expect Xhaka to take a part? <laughs> um, I don't think the team will be dissimilar, but I think it would just personally, I think it'd be Lokonga for uh, Xhaka. Otherwise, the team is kind of set up the way it should play anyway. Yeah, I, think my I have to agree with that. My ear. Didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I have to agree with that as well. Um, I think he'll go a bit more solid and put Lokonga there. Next to, uh, I'd love. I want to see Lokonga next to Party. Actually, he hasn't played next to him yet. He's played next to Jacko his first two games. So, did he? Yeah, yeah first two games it was Jacko, and... and then third game was Maitland Niles. Ah, I don't think of either. Femi's having a long blink Again. there, where your pitch is frozen. This pitch is frozen. Oh, yeah, I think he's, he's, he's well. frozen. No, 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 my is frozen. But, yeah, thing. I, I am looking forward to because now they've got a week to play together, haven't they? So, uh, in training. So, hopefully, this week we'll sh- they'll be able to form some kind of partnership. So, it'll be, it'll be very interesting to, show, to see them two together. And obviously, it's going to be a test. I mean, Basuma has been out, hasn't he? And it will be a test. I mean, you can guarantee that the team is going to be fit to, to face Arsenal. So it'd be a test to, to see um, them two against a, a Brighton midfield. And also it's a, a momentous season for um, him as well because he made his debut for England. That's uh, England. Fucking hell. For Belgium, he came on for Hazard, it says here, in the 74th minute as they won 5-2 away at Estonia. So I saw EST and I'm thinking England. I don't know why I did that. It's- terrible of me and he was an Anderlecht captain he's a, a hell of a player and I think he could be the future hopefully of the our midfield combo when Naka gets put in prison for strangling horses in an MMA match or whatever it is he's going to end up doing trying to <laughs> regain his fitness um, right next question is uh, from Fred for Femi what do we do with Pepe he'll have two years in his contract left come the end of the season as we paid so much for him and he's on such high wages, can we justify renewing his contract? If not, does any side have enough money to offer us decent money for him and cover his wages? That is a very good question, Fred. Floppy disk. I, know, I saw this question and I hoped you wouldn't ask me. Um... Carl, that question's <laughs> for you. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> um, to be fair, what is, is... so basically at two years, what we're saying is we always should make a decision on a player when they've got two years left and Pepe will have two years left and Saka will have two years left next year by the way as well Um, I would say he's like 26 ish it's a tough one because you're never going to get the money that you paid for him because he was never worth that money anyway and the market exactly so if you're looking let's say 30 million (laughs) <laughs> 30 million maybe you could get for him have a bloody good season to get that money, wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> you can't if you're going to get less than 30 then you're better off just renewing his contract to be fair but someone I, I think someone was explaining once I think this is what probably where you need to get Andrew who used to be on the show to explain something you about asking him five <laughs> shit. yeah five he could probably explain something about the contract how the transfer fee kind of pays for itself. Yeah, exactly. I yeah, I, I don't really know how it works, but it's it's I really think every year you're allowed to um, take a certain amount off by the because the player's value has decreased because he's worth less because his contract was running out a little bit. Andrew's expert. We love Andrew, and we do talk yeah. to him regularly. We've got a WhatsApp group room with him and Carl. You're in that, and Carl. Mm. Yes, with uh, with Simon and uh, Chris and Josh. It's one of our old ABW groups. 
and uh, we keep asking him to come on but he's he's he's, he's all loved up and he's married he's got a new puppy happy birthday to to five his puppy that might get him on carl we were nice about he's listening a puppy wonderland yeah yes. indeed. yeah so i think um yeah, I mean, it, it, if you take something like twenty million, it might actually cover the, the cost of the transfer. So for me, it's a decision of is Saka your permanent right winger? If he is, then why do you need Pepe? That that's the question that you're gonna have to ask yourself. I don't want to see him going on loan for a season and then, or well, he's on loan with an option, then he comes back and he's got one year left, and then you don't know what to do with him. No, just just make a decision next summer. Plus, we need someone. If if Smith Rowe or him or Saka get injured, then he can play either side. So we do need a third winger, but we don't need one that's cost seventy two million quid as yeah, a backup sitting winger. on the bench. But then the question I always ask people is, what would Emil Smith Rowe and Saka have cost us on the open market if we were buying them for, let's say, double young and English? Yeah, yeah, young and English. You're, you're talking sixty seventy. Yeah, easily. Each? Well, we turned down thirty-five to forty for Smith Road this summer, he didn't was, we? But that's the video just being pricks. <laughs> they knew that he was worth so much more, and they were just toying with us because they, yeah. they it was almost like they saw a wounded animal and mm. they thought, "Oh, let's just like see what we can do." Like they're just <laughs> fucking idiots. They knew, especially it come out, um, and that was all agent talk as well. I think as well because it got. The, the bid was obviously released to the press and that can only be done by either Aston Villa or Emil Smith Rowe, his agent, and then we end up signing he ended up signing a new contract anyway. So I think that was more from his agent to put a few more zeros on his contract or from Aston Villa just because they either went to warn us of uh Brendia, which we was never really in the market for, let's be very honest, probably and I still going to just donuts, and that's why we want to beat them when we play them. True. Right, next question is from Anu Andrew Agnelli, who has been on the show a few times. Um, for Carl, with his first assist for Arsenal, how many more assists do you think Harry Kane can rack up by the end of the season? Yeah, that's what I was going Well, pre-assist and assist, wasn't it? It, <laughs> it was, because he, yeah. he started the move. Um like, as I said, and with Femi, you couldn't write it. It was just the stuff of the, that dreams are made of. That you know, the best, the best player in the whole entire world, apparently. You know, Harry Kane. But the thing is, do you think it's Agent Kane? Because remember, he did start off as an Arsenal fan, so uh, he was in our books at one point, wasn't he? So maybe he's just, home. <laughs> maybe that's what it is. Like maybe that's exactly what it is, and maybe he's. Showing uh, Arteta, you know, I could be a Bamian's replacement, but <laughs> oh, it, it was it was a good time, and I'm happy. And I'd be very happy if he does it again at the Toilet Bowl Stadium. That would indeed be very good. Right, final I, question. I, I, I hope he has oh, the worst on. season ever. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we all hope that. Now we hope he doesn't get an injury. He just continues to play shit, like he did yeah. at the start of his career, where all those loans that he had, where he was rubbish. The thing um, is, his mind, his mind is in a different place. Like he, yeah, he doesn't want to play for top. His he mind doesn't. is in light blue up north. Oh, look, he scored a hat trick yeah. tonight. Did he? Yeah. I, I, had to dig, to, to, I had to really dig deep for the, that result, by the way. It's hidden <laughs> deep somewhere. <laughs> well, they play yeah, against a team that nobody man. knows. Yeah, the team don't even have a badge on the, on the app that I'm looking oh. at. <laughs> oh, dear. That's... that's... That's sad. so sad, but also, in fact, I usually go to whoscored.com. They don't even expand the league, the group pages for the conference league. In fact, I didn't even know they were playing until I saw the lineup, saw that he wasn't there. And someone tweeted, you're playing your £45 million against a team no one's ever heard of. £45 million defender. Right, final question. You can both answer this one. Start with you, Carl, from Matt Rail Roberts again. What has been the most iconic pictures, images, not videos, of the North London derby in the Emirates era? That's a tough one. I couldn't really think of one. Uh, for me, he's saying because the, the hybrid one was um, Henri on his knees in front of the crowd, like their celebrations were at the weekend. So what's yours? 
definitely beat Kalasnats. Do you remember when we beat um, them 4 2 and we took the um, the corner, <laughs> the corner flag, flag out of the ground? <laughs> yeah, that was that's iconic, I think, because that just showed the passion. Definitely, I, I did really like, like that. So for me, that's what it probably be. I was gonna pick that. I was gonna pick that game as well. <laughs> I was gonna pick Torreira's goal and swinging his shirt around. Um, all right, I'll go for something different. Uh, one of the five twos. I think the one where we were losing two 0 and Sanya just thumped that header in. And um, that game, I, I don't know which celebration in that game. Maybe it was the Walcott one. One of his. I think he scored two goals in that game. Just, just, just amazing. Van Persie that. that that yeah, turn at the edge of the box and shot like oh there were so many in that game that were iconic i can't even there's also it. the one where where um, walker was being carried off after his that's, knee injury that's the one i was talking about that was that was brilliant <laughs> as well yeah also i like the one where you've got the the two back-to-back five twos where you have both scoreboards next to each other that's a con. Now you my Walcott one. Yeah, that's. Um, you know what? They haven't beaten us at high at, at the Emirates in the Premier League in eleven seasons. And they shouldn't have won that game as well, because we were two 0 up and oh, it's a three two game. Bumping isn't it? them, yeah. We were all over them in that game. But I remember who was playing at the back. Was it Sylvester playing in that game? Oh, don't it's know. Always, oh, you're always so bound to good. lose a game. I think it was Sylvester because I think he scored. You're always bound to lose that game with those guys at the back. If yes. him or Scalacci, one of those guys, I don't know that. Oh, God. Scary stuff. <laughs> right. I think we're all done there, Carl. We are indeed. Um, I mean, it was a brilliant, like I said, it's a quick sum up. It was a brilliant uh, result against Tottenham. Uh, long, you know, everyone just had a brilliant week this week. No one's had no reason to complain at all. I mean, you always find some people on Twitter some reason for some. Apart from them but... cheating for their goal when our player was down injured and Moore knew he was injured and he stood above him and he, he held on to him and they didn't stop <laughs> by. It just shows the class of the club, doesn't it? That's the only exactly. thing I've heard about. Definitely bastards. But, um, are, we yeah. doing, are we doing shouts? Uh, yeah, we will do. I don't know who I'm on. That's just the last person that followed me. But, um, it was brilliant and Brighton on Saturday. Hopefully we get a, a, a win against them. We're kind of due a win against them, aren't we? Did we beat them did we beat them last season or did we draw? I think we we beat them last season, didn't we? Away. I'm sure we did. But either way, it will be um a game. Is it is it a five thirty kickoff? Was it a, um Yeah, five thirty yeah. Saturday? Time? Yeah. Um, we beat them 2-0 at home last season. We beat them 1-0 away last season. And then we had back-to-back losses the season before that. Ooh. So we're due... The season uh, before that, they were both draws. So we are due a, uh, a Another one against one. them, which, yes. which is brilliant. Right, um, that sums it up. So, Danny, go to you for your nod slash shout-out first. You Happy birthday, shot. 35 years old, the French Lamp Post. It is. Mr. It's today, isn't it? Yeah, 35 years young, him and Zlatan, combined age of 112, playing for AC Milan. No, neither of them can manage more than 15 minutes per game before they're stretched off. <laughs> Probably. Have you, have you two, who's the last person to follow you, Carl? Uh, I'm not going to do that because there's about three people that follow me today and I don't want to be greedy. So my shout out is going to be to Jeff Arsenal. It was really nice uh, talking to him whilst um, hearing him last week on the pod. I think he should come on a bit more often, but as you know, Jeff is uh, an extremely busy man. And also, thank you for getting me Crystal Palace tickets for that Monday. Good. Um, I don't even know who to shout out. Um, <laughs> shout out to... <laughs> I don't know. David Seaman has given me a lot of laughs this week, so shout out to him. Since you shouted out Juru, I can do an X player rack. Um, yeah, David Seaman, um, his interview with uh, Ramsdale gave me a lot of laughs. And then him tr- doing his training courses or something at, at uh, Colney as well. 
So yeah, Ooh. shout out to yeah. That's what, that's all good. Huh? You haven't seen yeah, him? Well, no, he's, what, he's, he's seen him doing his, his, his badges. Well, he's doing he's some been, work, or I think. Um, oh god, um, mis- not mis- 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 but Mertesacker has asked him to come and work with the young goalkeepers, so he's he's coming to work with them. Also, today's birthday, Matt Joseph played for Arsenal in 1972. Jason Crow, remember him? Yeah, he was born in 1978. Ben Chorley and David um, Agbonto Homer. Apparently 2001, probably a youth player. I've never heard of him. And uh, mm-hmm. Tomorrow, it's Julio Baptista. And Ian Allinson, there you go. I've got it. I've got all the details, Carl. Ian Allinson. Oh, what a moustache that man had! <laughs> oh, who the Baptista? What a player he was! Brilliant. Anyway, so anyway, Danny, you have to yes. be here. So, thank you very much for jumping on when you wasn't feeling the best. I wasn't. I had some tuna and, and uh, jacket potato. And now I feel okay. That's good. Uh, Femi, uh, thank you for coming on when you have been the man of the household this week. You've been doing everything and obviously Superman as well and jumping on the pod. <laughs> That's been fun. Good fun. Always good when Arsenal win. Always good when we beat Tottenham. I definitely agree. I, I <laughs> you can't. I think the best thing about this week was walking into work and seeing the Tottenham fans and just not saying anything. <laughs> But them knowing I was going to say something and them just <laughs> being annoyed that I haven't said anything yet and them bringing it up because that's what you need to do. Um, Double you, torture. You yeah, well, thanks for hosting, Carl. You've been, you've been splendid. Yeah. We don't have hosts. We just talk amongst ourselves. Yeah. Uh, the next show will be next week. Uh, yep. It's going to be a surprise. We don't know who's on yet, but we have... Oh, John said he might be able to make it, so we might try. Like tonight, we started it. Uh, today it's Thursday, 30th of September. We started at 9 o'clock because Fem's playing Mr. Mum at the moment. <laughs> He's got all of his hands full. And so next week, we're going to try and do it around John to get John on. So it'll be straight from the clinic. I've uh, dosed him down with... Uh, saline water and he'll be clean and fresh and ready to go hopefully and josh said yes as well oh lovely yeah, chris won't be on because chris doesn't like anything more than a threesome um so we move right everyone um have a good week let's hope we beat brighton and we will speak to you again next week take care everyone see you later Bye-bye. bye